welcome uh, to our, really, this is actually our eighth uh, New York Society for General Semantics program uh, of the season, and it's going to be uh, the last one of our spring season. Um, in honor of that, uh, the bar will stay open for the entirety of the event. <laughs> I knew that would be a cloud pleaser. Um, and uh, I'm really happy to welcome you. The, uh, and just to refresh your memory, the name of our program, the title of our program tonight is Between Map and Territory, The Art of the Tour Guide. And I'll start by reading the little blurb we wrote up uh, for it. Um, Alfred Korzybski, founder of the Discipline of General Semantics, famously insisted that the map is not the territory. And this saying serves to remind us that words are not the things they represent, symbols are not the reality they, they stand for, and our perception of objects in our environment are not the same as the events that actually occur in the world. The map is not the territory, but any given map may be more or less accurate uh, as a representation of that territory and be, may, may be more or less effective and useful in helping us to understand, experience, and navigate through that territory. Maps are visual representations mediating the territory by way of hand-drawn illustration, printed document, or of course of electronic display. Maps are guides that take us through a territory, and it seems only fitting to feature the human maps known as tour guides <laughs> in a program that allows them to discuss their, their art, their craft, and their trade. More than a living map, a tour guide is a performer, a storyteller and raconteur, a fusion of navigator and narrator. So, I want to um, add to this, you know, a few points that general <laughs> semantics says that the map is not the territory, and that is uh, often considered the first principle of non-identity. With that, the second principle of non-allness, that you can never describe the world fully, and so a map is never all of the territory. And the third principle, self-reflexiveness, that a complete map would include a map, would include the map in the map, and that would have to include a map of that map in the map, and so on. Um, and that would also have to include the map maker and, or the map, map user. Um, and that reminds us that maps may be things, objects, but we also need to think about people. And before there were maps, there were guides. Um, guides show us the way. God, uh, we all as kids play follow the leader. Um, and of course, the long history of guides is in the practical realm. Um, I think uh, in, in an interesting way, I'm, when I was a kid in, in grade school, we learned about Lewis and Clark. Um, we didn't hear so much. Now we hear more about, and I'm not even sure, how do we say it? Saka, Sacagawea. Sacagawea. Oh, that's right? Good. The guide who showed Lewis and I mean, what would Lewis and Clark be without the guide? Lost. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, there you have it. But uh, also, um, in kind of in that same era, we have the beginning of uh, what in, uh, is called the flaneur. Uh, that's a French word. Uh, those of you, any, anyone with a literary background, may have heard about the flaneur. Um, but this was a term that referred to, I mean, it's translated as stroller, lounger, saunter, or loafer, but it was the idea of somebody with a, enough leisure time to just walk the streets, just hang out. Um, and uh, the, uh, this works its way into literary representations through Edgar Allan Poe, quite notably, uh, is considered one of the, um, one of the innovators of literature that features a kind of flaneur experience. And his translator into French, Charles Baudelaire, uh, is also very much associated with this. Uh, in the 20th century, I want to note Daniel Borston. Daniel Borston, uh, aside from being a media ecology scholar, was a former librarian of Congress, which is kind of like the chief scholar of the United States. And uh, in one of his very influential books, The Image, uh, he talked about how in 
that over the course of the 20th century, the American people had developed extravagant expectations about the world and replaced our ideals with illusions and our capacity to create illusions. He coined the term pseudo-event for fake, what we call fake news today, uh, <laughs> things planted or created in, in the news media that wouldn't, be, wouldn't otherwise have happened if not for the news media. Um, and he also was the first to write um, in, in any great uh, way, significant way about celebrities taking the place of genuine heroes. Uh, and in the image, he also included, uh, included a chapter on tourism um, and compared it to travel where travel was genuine experience and exploration. Uh, the tour, tours come as prepackaged, as safe, easy to digest, and therefore not authentic. <coughs> and that's the negative. I, 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 don't, I wanna um, just in, include that to be, to be fair. Um, but I think you know, as we look to this idea of the tour and the tour guide, uh, and as I said, it's between map and territory, between navigation and narration. So I wanted to do one more for performance. So between performance and peregrination, what do you think of that, Matt? I'm, I'm still thinking about Boston's dis of the uh, <laughs> industry. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, I, but I think that that's what we look for, right, is that we don't look for uh, you know, getting getting shot at or or walking into uh, dangerous um, areas, and, and that's a kind of trade off of uh, uh, what we look for. Um, so I'm very pleased. You know, I think it's it's so appropriate for us here in the field of general semantics uh, to be able to have this panel and to really hear about what is uh, what is it that a tour guide does and. And so, uh, and in a way, this is a perfect bookend because the first event of, of our fall season uh, began with Matt, um, who has been doing poetry at the Players for a long time, um, succeeding our dear friend Mayor Ribolo, who passed away some time ago. Um, and so it's great that we can end with Matt uh, as well. Uh, and I was really thrilled to learn that Matt is a tour guide um, and uh, in fact, uh, work with tour guide organizations. Um, and, and so I'm going to introduce him, first of all, that Matt is the owner of Beautiful New York Tours. Um, is it that the tours are beautiful or that New York is beautiful? <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, he's the president of the Guides. Not anymore. Oh, former, former, former president of the Guides Association of New York City. <laughs> and the newsletter editor for the National Federation of Tourist Guide Associations. And Matt was very kind uh, to put, uh, recruit uh, this panel uh, for a conversation about tours and tour guides and guides and guiding tours. And uh, to lead that, um, and as some of you have been around for a while may think that, you know, my, all I want to do is, is um, kind of moderate these things and, and, and talk in these things, but uh, my fondest ambition uh, throughout this has been able to sit in the audience with you folks and listen to some other folks uh, to do a talk, and I'm really pleased that uh, we have that opportunity tonight because I can think of no one better to lead a discussion than Matt Baker. So I'm going to turn it over to Matt. Please welcome Matt Baker. <laughs> Thank you very much, and thank you, Lance. It's great to be able to participate in an event here at the Players with Lance again, because ever since he started doing these programs, he has not been coming to my poetry readings. So I'm very happy that he asked me to do this, and uh, he was extremely sweet. He said to me, Matt, I see you as the star of the show. And my first response was, are you crazy? Uh, but then my second was to uh, take the compliment and, and thank him for it, but I hope Lance will forgive me if I disagree because the stars of the show tonight are the four brilliant colleagues who have agreed to come and sit on the panel with me. Uh, we chose them uh, to represent a magnificently diverse cross-section of our industry. We have two native New Yorkers. We have a lady from Kansas City and a gentleman from Senegal. They range in age 
from early 30s to late 70s, and they range in experience as guides from two years to 24 years. I harbor a, an enormous amount of personal affection for them all and an equally enormous amount of professional respect. Please welcome Ms. Robin Gar, Ms. Ibrahima Diallo, Ms. Kristen Singleton Ferrari, and Mr. Lee Gilbert. So we want to start, I, I'm a big believer in the notion of guiding as a profession. Uh, there are people who retire from other professions and then proceed to guide. There are people who work their way into artistic professions while guiding for a living, but it is not a day job. And as a gentleman from the Tour Guide Association of Spain once said, it is not something you can learn how to do over a rainy weekend. It is a craft, it is a skill, it is a career, and it is a profession. That said, uh, it is also similar to publishing, and the way I heard someone say it, when he said, publishing is an accidental profession. Guiding is also an accidental profession. Nobody ever says, um, when I grow up, I want to be a tour guide. <laughs> so I'd like to start by asking each of you to say something about how you wound up in this crazy trade. Robin, we'll, we'll go in a line um, for now. All right. Uh, well, my former career was uh, in nonprofits in the museum world. Uh, I spent 30 years as an educator and a curator. So I've been giving tours my whole career. Um, but I'm I also a person who chose to live in New York. I came to New York when I was 16 to show horses in the garden, immediately fell in love with the city. And from that time until I graduated from college, it was just all about how to get to New York. Uh, so choosing to be a tour guide did morph over some time. Uh, friends and family would come to the city. I would take them around on tours. They loved it. I loved it. Um, I started expanding my tours and taking people a little further afield, you know, like up to the Bronx. <laughs> Um, Yay. Which seems so silly now as a tour guide. It's like, well, of course you go to the Bronx. But anyway. Um, and then when it came time for me finally to part ways with the museum field, uh, after that many years working for nonprofit boards, I finally wanted to strike out on my own. And it was just a, a natural progression for me uh, right into the tourism industry. And I found all these lovely people, and I'm here to stay. <laughs> well, um, being an immigrant, it was kind of the love that I had for New York City, which got me here in the first place, that I wanted to share. Okay, I wanted to share with the people uh, who visited the city as well, and also a gratitude to the city itself. And working as a sales manager in the clothing store was not doing that, okay? <laughs> when you speak different languages, you have that feel that you wanna talk, and you wanna talk to different people. So I was attracted by this profession, seeing the double-decker buses go by the store all the time. And this young lady was on top of the bus. Every time she passed, she was not talking. She was just there, not talking. And it made me mad. It somehow just was making me upset that these people were not you know, getting the energy that the city had and I had to do something about it, just like Clark. So I had to become a tour guide. And at first I was a ticket agent for one of those double-decker bus companies, just about three months to learn what it, what it took. And then before you knew it, you know, I was attracted uh, and I you know, became a tour guide. Wow. Um. <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I'm one of the native New Yorkers, and um, I went to the High School of Art and Design for photography, and I thought every time I would leave the city, uh, uh, when I was in my 20s, I got on a plane, I went to Italy, and I stayed for 13 years. So uh, every time I came home, uh, there was this great sense of, wow, what's changed? And I'd start walking. and. I discover, you know, new buildings and facades and uh, just new images to, you know, kind of record somehow in my mind, if nothing else. Um, 
I worked in the restaurant business for uh, several years, both in Italy and here in New York. And uh, speaking fluent Italian, I uh, uh, you know came back here to the city. Unfortunately, in the uh, interim of the 9/11 attacks, and uh, I was here in New York. I had a job interview at the World Trade Center on September 11th, which I had a massive, massive attack, asthma attack the night before, the attack that saved my life. And uh, the, you know, in the aftermath, I realized what a huge effect this was going to have on New York. And uh, working in tourism as a, 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 an innkeeper, eventually, uh, I went to Washington, D.C. And directing people around, you know, when you're standing behind a desk is one thing. But I always wanted to get out. So when I came back to New York, I was looking for a job. And, um, you know, when you're living with your mom for a couple of months, it makes you want to do things real quick. So uh, I uh, literally, on uh, two days after my birthday, which is January 1st, I said, wow, I remember I went on a tour of the uh, lower Manhattan area, South Street Seaport, in the African burial ground. And I said, now that's something I could do. And... Uh, I typed in the words New York City Tour Guide and up popped the Guides Association of New York and a company called The Levy's Unique New York, which is where I met Mr. Matt Baker. And it's now history since then. It's been seven years. <laughs> All right, um, I'm the other native New Yorker. When I was a senior at Dewitt Clinton High School in the Bronx, the borough of my birth, I was given a little book called Here is New York by E.B. White to read. Oh, oh, yeah. And uh, that was somewhat akin to giving Janis Joplin the keys to the Southern Comfort Distillery. Uh, <laughs> and I became absolutely obsessed with the city of my birth. However, um, after my army service, I got into the retail business and then the wholesale toy business. So this neighborhood to me is home. And I was involved in the toys and games business for 30 years. Now, what happened there is the big companies are buying up the smaller companies. And I was with one of those smaller companies. And I was, uh, shall we say, an awkward age and a high price point. And uh, what am I going to do? And a friend of mine uh, would always call up and he'd say, Lee, where's Webster Hall? How do you get there? And I would tell him. And he said, you know New York so well. Why don't you do something with it? And I started out. Uh, as a double-decker guide, and I got recruited from one company to another. And uh, this is my 24th year. I've been freelance, uh, I've been freelance for, um, since 2002. Um, and, and it's been an incredible experience. As much as I love the toy business, this has done much more for me. You're only 25. I, um, <laughs> I notice what feels to me like a recurring theme that that Ibrahima was the one who really sort of you know hit on the nose when he talked about at the end of the day this was all about love for the city in one way or another in some words or another each of you spoke to that and the other interesting thing is I know all of you well enough to know that each of you has placed various loves of yours in your tours you know Kristen talks about her love of Italy her husband is Italian you know, and she does tours multilingually, you know, in Italian and whatnot. Uh, Lee, uh, as being a little shy about his toy business, you know, background, he was one of the consultants on the first edition of Trivial Pursuit. Oh. Um, and what is a tour guide if not a professional trivia nut? Um, Robin, of course, has this great equestrian background that she touched on slightly and does tours of equestrian in New York. Uh, the only thing that there was no real mention of is, of course, I know Ibrahima's great passion for photography. And uh, I've been on your photography tour, and it's taught me how much you can do just with a, a little cell phone camera. It's bizarre. So <laughs> we're going to go back the other way now, since, since Lee was so patient on this last one. You know, we, you can tell we're all very shy reti retiring wallflowers. Um, <laughs> Let me ask what you have learned as a guide just about the nature of your work. What have you learned about what it means to get up every day to work? 
that you didn't know in your older profession? That that's you know how has work changed for you since you started guiding and make a living as a guide? Well, yeah, want, start with okay. Lee. Yeah. Well, when my kids were young, they thought that I slept in a three-piece suit, uh, <laughs> and so that is one distinct difference. Uh, shall we say it's a bit more casual, but the combination of that corporate background and a bit of the military. I'm still, for some guides, an absolute pain in the derriere about grooming. I said, you're dealing with people who are paying a lot of money. Don't look like you're homeless. Uh, and so th this is one of, the, uh, one of the things that I still bring with me uh, previously. But the idea of meeting people uh, from all over the world, and that I have, it's remarkable. I have, and for so long, too. I, uh, I have two military clients that I have been working with for over 10 years each. One 11, the other 12, as a matter of fact, was one referred me to the other, uh, which is part and parcel of this business, by the way. Mm -hmm. You do a good job, you're going to get referrals. No two ways about it. So, um, you know, this has been one of the delights. And, um, when I worked with some of these international groups, I've learned a lot. Uh, you know, I certainly, I wasn't oblivious to uh, certain situations, but you still uh, get to know uh, various habits that are not yours. Um, oh, sorry. Okay, should I pass? Yeah, pass. Time? <laughs> I'm sorry, can we, can we go? What you've learned about work, what, what it means, you know, to me, at least, going to work means something very different now that I've found a career that I really love from what it was before. What have you taken from that? Well, interestingly enough, uh, this morning, I was not feeling in the kind of uh, vein of let me get up and go. But I have to say, uh, one thing that I do mention to people about what I love and what I've learned is, um, you know, the, the drive. And, of course, when you arrive and the words come out, good morning, my name is Kristen. I'm a New York City tour guide. I'm going to be your tour guide today. Really just, you know, kind of clears the clouds and whatever is going on, everything kind of moves forward. I think um, one of the best things that um, the game kind of brings is coordination. And when you're dealing with, um, you know, large groups of people, which can be at times from uh, two uh, to three or four hundred, and you're working with other tour guides and you're making sure that a schedule is adhered to, uh, coordination is something that uh, this you know, occupation will give you uh, and that you will have to kind of learn and deal with to make all of the pieces of the puzzle go together. A lot of people arrive with uh, an itinerary in their pocket and they think that, you know, okay, we're starting here and we're gonna go there and then I go, yeah, and Broadway's closed down right now, so we're going to have to jump to doing something else or making it work in one fashion or another. So um, I would say, you know, secondly, definitely, you know, living in the moment and making sure that everything goes as smoothly as possible. I think lastly, in the vein of what uh, Lee was saying, definitely dealing with the, the client and the internationalism of the people that you have in front of you you know the personality or the character of a person from germany uh today i had literally uh three germans two austrians and a couple from holland and i said okay i you have to all promise me that you're not going to stand and speak german the entire time that we're together <laughs> but you know also you know being able to develop a rapport and knowing the internationalism and what your client is all about, the things that they are going to uh, kind of uh, perk their ears to that you have in connection to their culture. Bring him up. Um, just to tag along briefly, <coughs> I think tolerance is something that I had already, but when you're from a country where there are different, different ethnic groups, but when you meet people from different backgrounds and they are together on the same tour for the same purpose, you know, you get to be more tolerant with these people, no matter what they believe in, what, you know, what party they vote for and, and things of that nature. You be, I, I, bec I became more tolerant over the years being a tour guide. 
um, a tour guide talks for a living but also listens. In, in order to, to provide a great tour, you need to be able to, to listen to the body language, to the tone, to all the information that you gather from the people prior to the tour. So from there, you know you don't know. You're like, the more you do the tours, the more you, you seek education, you know, you, the more you, you want to improve, the more you want to educate people. So I learned that I, I don't know, and I don't mind learning more. Um, and also, you know, no matter where you look at in the city, if you come back, you look at the same place, you see something different. So if I was not a tour guide, I don't think I will see the city the same way. Because you know? again, you go back to the same place, two weeks later, you look at the same thing, you have a different feel about it. And, you know, being a tour guide allowed, allowed those, those type of feelings. All right. Well, for me, the first, the biggest change was uh, the independence thing that I mentioned earlier, uh, breaking away from having a board of directors and a director and my own staff. I'm my own person now, so that's a big change for did, me. Did you say that's a positive or a negative? I think it's a positive okay. <laughs> because uh, I've always been independent, and, which is one reason I struggled with nonprofit boards. I'm opinionated, as my colleagues know. Um, and as a tour guide, you get to offer your opinions, not, you know, we don't get into political or religious or anything like that, but certainly you're giving your opinion of the city. It's just unbiased. The other thing I learned, which really surprised me, and Lee knows this, is um, I've been fortunate enough to work on the tour boats for the past six months. I'm from Kansas City, Missouri. Boats, <laughs> boats were not my thing. Um, I get seasick. I was just like, oh, but I can't tell you how much I love being out on the harbor. Uh, when I am, and, and now it's, it's translated in my, all my other tours, my bus tours and my walking tours. I think giving tours makes me as happy as sitting on a horse. It really does. You cannot slap the f smile off my face uh, when I'm giving tours. And it's just very satisfying. Excellent. Very satisfying. So, so all of this tells us you know, what's woken us up, essentially, in guiding. But let's consider the question of comparison. I definitely want to start with Robin here, not just because she's sitting next to me, but because as the newest guide, you're the one with the freshest memory of doing other things. I mean, I can barely remember you know, the problems that I dealt with making a living with other stuff. What else is guiding similar to? And that doesn't have to be just professionally, though I'm thinking professionally. Uh, you know, is there anything else you would compare guiding to? To be a guide is like X. What's the X? Well, it is like being a director of a museum almost. Um, I consider New York City the biggest <laughs> museum and the biggest museum object in the world. So I kind of approach it that way. Um, Kristen mentioned it earlier. You have to have a sense of coordination, uh, timing, uh, your presentation, they have to be able to hear you and see you, and I'm height challenged, so I have to come up with ways to deal, uh, to deal with that. Right. Um, so I think a lot of the things that I used in my former profession, I actually use quite a bit, almost every day. I don't necessarily require every single person to answer every single question, but does have anyone have anything to add to that? Uh, I don't want to stifle anyone, but I appreciate that some questions may make more sense for individuals on the uh, panel. Yeah. I was going to say, uh, it's a dangerous concept, I know. I, 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 have, uh, I have thought about this a while back. Um, I, I think if you ask me what it is to be a guide or what can be compared to as opposed to what it means to give a tour, to, to be a guide can be to be a poet. Um, mm -hmm. A tour has a rhythm. You know, there you cannot take that away from touring. Um, the city is the inspiration. It changes all the time. The writer, the main writer, main poet, is the guy. He conducts the other writers who are the, the visitors, the audience that you have. And the feel, the experience will be unique. Every single person on that tour will have sensations that will be different. If you do not always explain why you say things, people will come up just like they just read a poem and they will translate it differently when they go. I, I wanna latch onto that directly because that really speaks to the next question I had in mind. Uh, and I was looking up, it's like even my notes are long-winded. Um, you know, 
<laughs> the importance of the individual personality of the guide. I mean, we have often talked to the Guides Association about how, um, you know, you could take the same tour along the same route with two different guides and get two completely different tours from it. And, you know, we all know guides. Uh, I won't name them here because our, our audience doesn't know them, but you, you can fill in the blanks, you know, with people who wear feathers and things like that. We all know guides who are iconoclastic personalities. So, you know, how much is the tour about the city and how much is it about the guide? How intrinsic is the individual personality to the tour? Krista? I think, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say this in a little homage to you. Oh, God. It's the, it's the actor. <laughs> it's the actor that, that, you know, is in all of us in one way or another, you know? We, uh, we consider New York City our stage. And, you know, we're just merely the players, you know, kind of interpreting what we know and what we feel about the city. So, you know, um, I, I did some acting uh, here in New York, in Brooklyn, and I always felt a little, uh, you know, badly because I didn't want to be that person that took away the possibility for somebody who came here from, you know, Indiana and is, you know, going on 70 castings a week and, you know, try, and here I am just happy to say, oh, you know, it's a bit of a hobby, you know, so now I get to go out and act every single day. I can, you know, be as funny as, as I feel the, the, my audience, you know, is, and it's almost to have an unscripted, you know, piece of work, but all of the, you know, facts and all of the, um, the baseline is there for you to, you know, create it and make it, make it your own, you know. I'm not a great comedian. I, I really have finally learned to be able to tell very bad jokes <laughs> while I'm on a tour. And um, so I think that, you know, in a, in a kind of collaboration of the two questions coming together, I would say that, you know, leading back to being an actor or being on stage or thinking of something that connects you to a character from a film is definitely a, a huge connection for us. Who can add to that? Well, you, you, you look like you're brimming with something. I yeah. certainly can. And, and <laughs> the comedy, uh, I have a certain amount of uh, comedic material that I use. <laughs> and we're laughing already. The phrase <laughs> certain amount is, is well known in this uh, organization. Uh, yeah. um, sort of a basic one, if I have a group off the bus or it's a walking tour and we're going to meet in a certain spot, we're going to meet over here in 15 minutes and look for me, I promise I won't shave. <laughs> so that usually gets them. Uh, but uh, the old Victorian adage uh, that in mixed company you shouldn't talk about sex, religion, or politics. So you have to be very careful with that. Um, uh, I've teetered on the brink a couple of times. Uh, and in this particular age, uh, I've, become, I've become very careful. Yeah. Uh, now, and assume nothing, I, and what I'll bring that up in the old cliche, one of the first three letters of assume, um, I have on my <laughs> website that I do sports tours. So I had an inquiry from a Canadian family that wanted a sports tour, and what do I do? So I am an avid baseball fan. I'm watching the New York Yankees and Joe DiMaggio play. You can right? both be an avid baseball fan and watch the New York Yankees. No, Ooh, I'm sorry. You're in trouble here. Yeah. Oh, okay, gentlemen. Yeah. Carry on. Anyway. <laughs> anyway so no, it's Robin and I were giving each other a hard time about it before the show. Carry I'm on. Sending <laughs> rhapsodies about baseball. And then they said, in basketball, is the city game. And I'm thinking of taking him to Holcomb Russell Park and, and the cage, etc. But they're Canadians. Of course. They play a game on ice. Oh, okay. And they said, you know anything about hockey? And I said, oh, yes. She said, because basketball is meaningless to us. So I ended up doing a baseball slash hockey tour. But uh, I made a dangerous assumption in my initial correspondence with them. So 
now I tend to be a bit more cautious. With, with that in mind, with, with that whole concept in mind, I want to actually skip ahead to a question I was going to ask a little later, but you know, you, you bring it up about choosing what tour to give, essentially. So I, wanna, I, I have it written here, of course I can't find it, but um, you know, each of you has designed, I'm pretty sure, at least one tour from scratch. You know, you've mapped it out, you've you know, walked the route, you've made the changes, you've researched the content, you know, and this more than anything I think really touches on the motto of the organization we're talking to tonight about the map is not the territory. How do you choose it? How do you decide what goes on a tour and what doesn't? Lance touched on the notion that you really can't do everything. So how, how do you decide what belongs on a tour? You know, and so, I mean, you spoke about talking to the client. Obviously that helps. But we all know we have clients who simply say, we're in your hands. Show us what you've got. How, how do you make the call? Anyone who was first inspired, Kristen. Uh, you know, I, it's very funny. A few uh, weeks ago, I uh, had a, a family from Boston, and uh, the woman uh, walks up, and she was expecting that uh, I, we were going on a 9/11 Memorial Museum tour. And uh, as my sense to tour do. guides, we <laughs> are not allowed to do those tours. That is only for the museum docents or, you know. Uh, people to go on and I personally have no interest in being in the belly of that area anyway, but I do uh, a very um, Personalized but mapped out point to point to point tour of the wall of the World Trade Center area And she said well, I don't need anybody to walk around and read the things uh, about the you know 9-11 attacks to me and before I could open my mouth because I, I, I never, ever, ever tried to be rude to someone, you know, but she was about to get it, you know. And I turned and her husband said, honey, now she's a tour guide. I'm sure that she's not going to read to you. And what um, I do is uh, initially, as uh, Matt would say, you map out a plan and you know the streets that are going to kind of easily get you from point A to point B, and you know where you want to end your tour. But you, your tour has to have a rhythm, okay? Uh, you want to start with maybe the oldest place and move to uh, something else that's going to be convenient for you to arrive at without, and you don't want to, you know, uh, kind of crisscross back, you know, walking down the same street uh, in order to arrive at, you know, your next point, etc. So uh, all of these things become important in your mind, the way that you lay things out, but you also have to be able to adapt in the situation that a street is closed, there's construction workers, or you know you just don't want people to see something that's going on there. You know what I mean? So uh, indeed, you know I think that one of the very first um, uh, challenges and things that we have to um, really learn as tour guides is to personalize our own maps and make them uh, our storyline, okay? So that street, you know, value of point A to point B, et cetera, also becomes your highs and your lows and your flow and your ebbs to a story. Excellent. Yes, please do. <laughs> well, I have two approaches to that. One, you said, how do you sort of develop a tour from ground up? What gives you your inspiration? Um, I think we all walk around the city. We see something. For me, um, my Washington Heights tour came about uh, because I took a tour with a fellow tour guide of Highbridge and discovered the Harlem Speedway, which fed right into my love of horses and the history of the equine in the city, which is such an integral part of this city, believe it or not. Um, and so I just spent time in the neighborhood uh, up on the high bridge, getting the vantage of the speedway, and then walking almost concentric circles <laughs> mm -hmm. to figure out how I could tie in the rest of that equestrian story, the personalities, and then just the general history. And I think the general history is sort of what is what Kristen was talking about. We have that A, B, C, D thing we can talk about. The Revolutionary War, you know, the, the Industrial Revolution and rise of our seaport, you know, all that stays the same. And then you sort of plug in those historical points around it. So it's a, a two-pronged approach. It's your own personal interest in the specific story you want to tell throughout your tour, as well as sort of the general 
this is what the canvas is giving me that I could talk about. It's an excellent point, but let me pursue it with you for a moment sure. because uh, Kristen made a very good point. I, I don't think she used this exact word, but what it sounded to me like you're basically talking about a structure. Yep. And that's what I'm getting at. I completely recognize the importance of the inspiration, especially when it's a topic you love and you're like, oh, I can build a tour topic around this. But it almost becomes as important, you know, Tennessee Williams said you have to kill your darlings. <laughs> the things you choose, you know, it speaks to the structure of your, store, of your tour as much what you choose not to put on it as what you choose to put on it. You know, just a classic example, my Irish Heritage walking tour, we do not go by Al Smith's house. Al Smith was one of the most important Irish New Yorkers in our history. It's too far out of the way. The yeah. geographical logistics right. of the tour, it right. just doesn't work. We make concessions to the geography. So that becomes part of it as well. How do you, I mean, how you choose what to put on a tour, you have that central topic that you come in, and then everything becomes subservient to that central topic. But how do you decide what doesn't go in? <laughs> how do you pointedly decide what doesn't go in? Well, sometimes closures. Okay. Yeah. You know, right now the Hispanic Society of America is closed. Oh, is it? And I cannot show those magnificent Anna Hyatt Huntington equestrian sculptures, which is a big part of my Harlem Speedway tour. Um, so now I actually cut through Trinity and talking to a fellow tour guide, Mr. Washington, I have learned of several personalities buried in Trinity that tie into my story. So you have to be able to, to change. And then you, you also have to too change much on one, yeah. with your clients. I had clients up there once who were a little bit elderly and going all the way around the cemetery to see Ed Koch's grave, I knew was gonna be too, like add too much to the time. So I think we're all very good at improvising right away and saying, you know what, I'm gonna turn here and go down this way today. And, you know, and talk about Audubon instead of, you know, the mayor. It makes me think of, you know, what, what, what Kristen says about sometimes you just don't want people to see what's going on there. We all have the experience where everyone here has done work with school groups. We all know how it is to have a young high school choir stopped at the red light right next to the Museum of Sex. <laughs> and you cannot miss it. I mean, it's there, you're at the red light. That's when I stole, you know Jonah Levy, of course, young yes. tour guide who, who gave us this great line. Yeah, don't get excited. You have to be 18 unless you go with your parents, and you do not want to go you with your parents. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. there, there, there are definitely a couple of things. I, I think to, to, to say that when you don't point at it, they don't see it, it's not always the case. But I will paraphrase Lee, who said, they don't know what you don't show them. You, you said that. I've said that to many people. Who, who, who ask about touring and the fear of not knowing about everything that is on the route. They don't know what you don't show them. If, if that's what you exactly said. Time, duration basically, you know, weather, um, your goals, a theme. Those are things that really define what you choose on your tour. Um, if you doing a tour about Irish immigrants, uh, if that's French, man, I want to talk about it. Um, if you don't have time and it's too far out, of course not. If your theme is about, you know, those things kind of define. But personally, if you have enough topics within that route, it could be a straight line. I decide by picking the things that makes them feel something, you know, a sensation like. You have to, to react after I talk about it. You, you must, you have to say, wow, or you have to <laughs> laugh, or you have to cry. If you, if you don't do one of these things, I haven't done my job. Right. Okay, so I pick deciding on that. And I also consciously don't talk about things nowadays. In the beginning it was because I don't know much, but even still I learn. Um, but I consciously don't talk about things because I want them those things to be the introduction to the next thing or to be the conclusion of the other things. Or because, of course, uh, I want them to ask me about it and I will incite them to ask me about it so it becomes even more improvised. So when you do that, and you're a good judge of, of, of what works and what doesn't, but we all have those weird groups Ooh. where I have a standard line that I use in every tour and it gets the reaction, you know, we did the parents line, you all left, it was expected, it's how it works on tour. The day comes, <laughs> you do the bit, you show the beautiful work, you know, the Audrey Munson statue or whatnot, you rave about how great it is, 
and you can hear and that everybody <laughs> looks at you like, like mm-hmm. uh-huh. <laughs> how do you handle that uh, this morning I was at the Statue of Liberty on the pedestal and uh, the weather was not great today I'm glad it wasn't yesterday it was even worse yesterday <laughs> which was <laughs> even worse and uh, I don't know if I learned this joke from you but there's a horrible joke uh, the uh, Verrazzano Bridge. It's not a joke, it's a true story. It's a true story. It's a true Giovanni story. Giovanni da Verrazzano, because da uh-huh. I, I have to say that correctly, yes. my husband will kill me. Uh, Giovanni da Verrazzano comes to uh, the waters of the Atlantic and passing the harbor, he goes all the way through the Atlantic down to the Caribbean, where he is promptly eaten by cannibals. Ah. I guess that was their first taste of Italian food. Ah. Now, you see, it could die or it could not. You know? Well, all of a sudden... It, it doesn't die when I tell it. You know, it doesn't die where I say that I'm not the greatest joke. My entire group burst out laughing. It scared me. <laughs> uh, my, I usually say that was the beginning of the Western Hemisphere's affinity for Italian cuisine. Uh, in, the, in the Museum of Sex, again, I look around, and if everybody looks old enough, I'll say that's where the term mountain exhibit has a totally different meaning. <laughs> and the abbreviation is Mo Sex. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, there's the the flop of the of the of the silence, and uh, you got to keep it moving. Yeah. You know, you you just you got to keep it moving. And I just go, well, I guess I'll be laughing at that joke. So let's move on. <laughs> and you know, uh, and you and you, you take it forward. You know, sometimes there are groups that are just so dead serious yeah. that that you can't. It's like being a comedian. I go Absolutely. back to being an actor, and and, and where you get that. Oh man, I'm I'm bombing today. You know what I mean? And then you just stop. You stop that rhythm, and yeah. and you begin in a in a whole other vein or something. Or maybe, thank goodness, you know, someone else will pop up with something and say, you know, come on, guys, lighten up. You know what I mean? To to the rest of the group. But with student groups and with older people, you know, sometimes we're on a tour and there's this group of you know. Uh, very, um, you know, sometimes I get religious groups and you're just like, oh my God, I can't say that. Oh my, oh goodness, not God. Okay, all of these things, yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's all relative. You, you've got to feel, you know, uh, what you, you drop once and you go, okay, let me just keep it moving and you just try to keep the, the rhythm as best you can. Later I'll tell you how I made a priest angry. Um, but anyway, uh, so let's, I, I want to go back again because it touches on a question I had planned anyway, but it really, you know, it, it's very appropriate to bring up now um, with facts. You, you, you told a great story about, you know, I don't need someone to stand there and read to me. Of course not. Hello. You know, it's not what we do. That would be inauthentic. Um, but... It is also, and I think this speaks to the personality of the guide, the, the intrinsic nature of the personality of the guide. It is important that what we do is not something that there is an app for. Andy Cedor says that there is no app for that. Uh, nevertheless, facts, and I'm looking at Lee here because I know he's a stickler for them, and rightly so, are part of our tour. They are what we do. We all have, there's a very famous saying in our industry, never let the truth stand in the way of a good story. (laughs) So how important are facts and how important is the story? How do you squeeze that tall tale in when it's just too good to miss and how do you still make it clear these are the facts? It works very well Uh, and again, you have to gauge your audience. Uh, just to bring up something that I no longer do, but I had been doing long before the 45th president ran for office and <laughs> got elected, is that Donald Trump lives there, but he isn't home right now. He's overseas awaiting the birth of his next wife. <laughs> now, if you have anybody from a so-called red state, you're in trouble. And so, even though you know, you've been using that line for years, long before, decades, you yes. know, while he was still looking for Obama's birth certificate, <laughs> I used it. Um, anyway, um, how to get that one in? Then there's um, Winston Churchill Park. This is a small 
square. Yeah, well, New York has a bad sense of geometry. It's really a trapezoid that sits on Bleecker on one side and Downing Street on the other. And the building on Downing is number 10, and I'm deadly serious. Um, and I'll tell some of the classic Churchill stories. Uh, Nancy Astor also had American roots, as he did. His mother was American. And she once said to him, and politically, they didn't get along. And this is all true. She said, Winston, if I were married to you, I'd poison your coffee. And he said, Madam, if I were married to you, I'd drink it. <laughs> and then, uh, although he was certainly not a misogynist, uh, he was married to Clementine for over 60 years, I think. Um, uh, another woman, a political opponent by the name of Bessie Braddock, uh, saw him at a reception. Churchill liked his whiskey and his brandy. And she said, Mr. Churchill, you're drunk. And he said, Madam, you're ugly. But tomorrow, I'll be sober. <laughs> <laughs> now, there's one that the late William Manchester used. How the hell he got it, I don't know. But since it got into print from a major publisher, I use it. But again, I look at the ages. That Churchill lost the election right after World War II to the Labor Party, Clement Attlee. And the men's room in the House of Commons had one of those long trough-like urinals, or as the British would pronounce it, urinal, which I thought was a Welsh soccer player, but that's all right. Uh, anyway, uh, now that one. Uh, and Attlee is at the appliance, and he's the only one in the men's room. Churchill comes in and goes to the extreme other end, and Attlee said, What's the matter, Churchill, feeling a bit standoffish today? And Churchill's response allegedly was, no, but every time you see something big, you want to nationalize it. So, uh, that, I don't know where Manchester got it from, and that one I, I walk carefully on. Yes. And I'll just add, I'm a kind of a stickler for facts, too. I don't like okay. the legend has its stories. And there's so many stories in this city that are based in fact and truth. Some of them are hilarious. Some of them are sad. I, I just feel like there's no reason to perpetuate the alligator in the sewer. I mean, it's great. <laughs> it's great if you're at 14th Street in front of the Otterness, because then you have it. But you know, other than that, you don't. You know, you don't need to. You don't need. I don't it. think you need to. Um, I think there's enough fact in so many. It's the people that make this city, and there's so many personalities and so many stories. I really don't think you need the old legend has it. Well, you know, interestingly enough, um, in the facts of you going, you know, farther back, and we're talking of stories and, you know, anecdotes and things that, you know, uh, fact is that sometimes we hear that so-and-so lives in this place and uh, purchased this building for that much and spent so much on, and uh, I, I'm going to admit this is really, really hard for me to say. But uh, there's a building that Anderson Cooper um, bought in the, the Greenwich Village area, and I mixed the two firehouses up. There's one on a back street, and there's another one on West Third Street. And so I'm standing there, and uh, it's very early on a Saturday morning, and I'm telling how you know there's this beautiful building, and you know Anderson Cooper, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, I was with a, a person who turns out to be my boss, so to speak, um, as freelance consultants once in a while. We work for companies where there is a supervising person. And he goes, no, doesn't he live around the corner? And uh, I said, holy crap. I just totally like, mixed the two addresses up and just thinking two firehouses. So facts are very, very important. But to the point of that, you know, if you fluff or make a story, you know, better than it actually is to make it sound good, it's it's all good. But when you kind of botch on a fact of an address or who built a building or something like that, okay, you know you need to kind of, you know, get yourself together and open up whatever. And sometimes these are facts that are based on nothing more than what you heard on TMZ or on, you know, some other uh, gossip, you know, thing, etc. of, you know, what goes on in a building and things like that. So very 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 important you know you get a fact and you just you know have to remember exactly where it came from and where it's supposed to be and it's a strange balancing act that because of course really, ultimately really we all know 
that at the end of the day, it truly does not does matter, not matter where exactly. Anderson Cooper lives. <laughs> <laughs> it really, if he did live around the corner, it would change absolutely, absolutely nothing. nothing. Nevertheless, if the fact remains that he doesn't live there and you get called out on that, that is the only part of your tour they are ever going to remember. <laughs> but but here, here's my feeling, uh, to be sure about it. You know, facts to me are very important because I never know who is in sitting the, yeah. in my audience. Um, I've I'm had sitting. friends of John Lennon. I've had, you know, drummers of Bob Marley. You know, and you go talk about Apollo Theater, you know, you go talk about Dakota House, you start to talk about people who live there. Better get it right. You know, better get it right. Yes. Even if it does not matter. You know, the sister of someone who died in night. You know, there are things that really are, I like to, create legends about me. If I'm going to say something, it's going to be about my ex-wife, if, if, you know, if it's going to be <laughs> some, like, you know, something or something that they can, they can oh, figure out, he's lying, or an interesting, a fun fact. For example, you know, it's not allowed to walk around with ice cream in your pocket on Sundays in New York, or it's not allowed to honk in New York, you know. Things that they're gonna go at the edge, and, and <laughs> like, Wait, is this true? Is this cream? not true? Yeah, that is actually, that is actually true. Um, you know, those those type of facts. But if if I'm in the middle of a story, it's usually a true story, and the facts are gonna just follow being true. That's exactly. really that's just me. part of getting to this. Is read all the time, not only books, but signage. Uh, whatever it might be. You know, Kristen mentioned she had this somewhat uh, aggressive Bostonian who didn't want her to read to her. Uh, I have the, one of the military groups that I deal with are standard operating procedure, use the military term. It's the first thing we do is go to the 9 11 Memorial Museum. Now, and as Kristen said, we can't conduct tours there. That's a rule of the museum. No, the museum. It's forbidden. Yeah. Um, and they have some other archaic rules. It to acquire, it you have to make an appointment and pay $35. The thing is just, uh, you know, what, what can I say? Uh, don't get me started memorial. with those yeah. guys. Um, anyway, um, so the drill is okay, we're going to meet at the exit. There's only one exit from the museum at such and such a time. So I, and again, I said, hey, look for me, I want to shake, da, 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 da. I'll meet you here. I got up early from the museum, and it was a beautiful day, I'm stretching my legs, and I got over to one sec section of the wall of the South Tower, section S is in South 5. And I looked down, and there's a name, Stephen Gerard Siller. Now I knew exactly who he was and what happened, but I had never seen his name there. Stephen Gerard Siller, if you're not familiar with it, was the member of a fire rescue company who was off duty mm -hmm. and realized what happened, donned his gear, 34 pounds, 17 kilos, if you will, and ran through the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel to get to Tower 1 to join his colleagues, and he lost his life there. There's now a tunnel to Towers Run and a foundation uh, in his name. And this, to me, is an incredible hero, one of the 343 <coughs> firefighters. And then Father Judge, who I used to see at Chumley's. Really? Really? Yeah. I didn't know yeah. Father Judge liked Chumley's. That's <laughs> great. I used to have a big picture of him behind Really? The bar. That's great. Does, does anyone here remember? I mean, I ask people this on my tour, and fewer and fewer hands go up. Does anyone remember who Father Judge was? Oh, good. I love adults. I work with so many school groups. It's depressing. <laughs> Pardon me while I count all the gray hairs in my so, Excellent. I, I do talk <laughs> about Father Judge and one other, Cantor Fitzgerald, uh, the company lost 658 employees, the vice president. Uh, well, the vice president, Gary Frederick Lupnick, uh, his father was one of my history professors at Queens College. So, uh, to use the term, I always go and say hello. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. All right, I, I want to switch gears a <clears> little <throat> bit. Um, and and we, we touched on a little aspect of this, but I want to broaden it up a tad. Because um, I, I 
still am haunted by vivid memories of you know the company that uh, Kristen and I met in. It's a, a company that specializes in school groups. And I remember the day that we had a nine school bus, nine guide move, uh, all going out to Liberty and Ellis Islands. Uh, and the buses were two hours late. And so it was decided we would skip Liberty Island and go straight to Ellis. And two of the tour guides wound up being held back in the security tent while their groups wound up on the boats and wound up wandering around Ellis Island without a guide. So with this in mind, what are some of the things that can go horribly wrong on tour and how do you handle it? Who goes first on there? Kristen. I am going to, you know what I'm, uh, you know where I'm going with this. <laughs> oh God. Yes. The, yeah, the Washington Juvies. Oh. Uh, Matt and I were on a, it was only two of us or three buses. It was the two of us. And um, we, we, we had to alone. do a, a Harlem <laughs> tour and uh, I, I could actually almost get emotional. Speaking of it, uh, the buses were coming from Washington, D.C. I'm also a licensed tour guide in Washington, so I'm thinking, eh, I've got a little connection, I know what these kids are about. And um, all of a sudden, uh, the first, there was a car that arrived kind of as an escort to one of the buses, and it said Department of Corrections <laughs> on the side door. And, uh, we basically were uh, guiding <clears throat> two busloads of uh, underage of minors who were in the correction system. Uh, one young lady on my coach was um, was in because she had uh, she was in for attempted murder on her own mother, and uh, basically we were biding their time because. They had no beds for these kids to be in, in a changeover, and they had been put on punishment, not allowed to go back to their families because they had all done something against whatever the rules were. On that note, I take a deep breath. So uh, at a certain point, uh, Matt and I look at each other, and I said, Matt, um, you know, these are like, the youngest criminals probably in the United States. And as we were walking to the Malcolm X um, uh, Mosque, the original um, place of his services, a guy comes out onto uh, out of a building on 126th Street in Harlem, 26 or 27. And, I forget. Yeah, and uh, he said, ah, y'all got those too. And I'm like, what is he talking about? And the guy looks down and he goes, nice bracelets about nine or ten of the kids in my group were actually wearing ankle monitors and oh. I literally began walking faster <laughs> um, by the time I got back to the coach I would realized obviously that um, you know these correction officers probably were literally risking the fact of losing one of these you know I, I hate to say it mini criminals and um, it was uh, one of those days where I had to just make sure that all I did was get them from the bus, take the walk if it was a problem, walk them someplace else. Uh, I think that it was uh, finally at the African burial ground that I said, okay, that's it, everybody back on the bus, because one of them decided that he was going to spit on the ground. So, um, you know, at times you are uh, challenged with logistics, with who you're dealing with and trying to make sure that an elderly person can get through a walking tour, it says walking tour, and you know, or you're dealing with a circumstance where, you know, uh, you find yourself affronted by something <coughs> completely, completely, you know, you're never ever going to have to do that again. You know, you so yeah, at least you hope. <laughs> well, I, I would probably walk away from the next one. <laughs> well, uh, it's not a competition, but anyone want to follow that? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, well, you, know, you know, not horribly wrong, but there are a lot of things that have happened over the 10 years I've guided that went wrong. Um, the, 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 the small ones would be uh, someone did not get on the bus and we left 
they were there, they only spoke French and they did not have a cell phone and basically they don't know what hotel they're staying at. And <laughs> Don't you have a 10% rule? You know, I do have a 10 You could lose 10% of the group. <laughs> that was the times when I almost never counted the number of people on my tour based on the fact that they can count me. Right. Um, and I had to find that guy. And I luckily found him just 30 minutes later based on a map in my head, you know, of potential places that he could have been. Um, that, that's just one thing, but when you do a walking tour in Brooklyn, you say, welcome to Brooklyn, good news, we're still alive, I'm joking, <laughs> but, you know, you really see someone chasing another person, <laughs> they dress on a suit, they dress, they chasing someone, and then a car pulled over, and the front window, the passenger window opens, and the guy jumps head first <laughs> in that car, and it takes off, and the guy in the suit is running behind that. I don't know what you tell the client after that. They shooting a movie. You know, that's something that went wrong. Um, when a bus pulled over and someone said, uh, "I forgot my mother," on a bus, that I think topped it off. You know, if things can go wrong yeah, on a tour. I have, yeah, bus. Some bus war stories. That can be frightening. I have this lovely client from Georgia. And she brings up groups of, primarily, they're all seniors. And um, she had contracted the bus uh, with a certain company here. Um, I won't mention a name, but their livery is black and gold. And uh, <laughs> the bus pulls up, and um, these are seniors, and this bus doesn't lower. Oh. Oh. Okay, so in older, older equipment, they usually carry a footstool, which is a little yeah, risky, it's but it's too. better than making seniors who may be arthritic or whatever try to, you know, make like their rockets. Uh, and it, it just then we finally get everybody on board, and no microphone. Oh. 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 That's the tour awesome. operator, the tour Sorry. operator. Is furious mm -hmm. and I'm saying, I mean, she's Lee. What can you do about this? <laughs> well, you know, I didn't tire those guys, uh, which I didn't say. And I happen to be a longtime friend. We used to work together with the sales manager of the biggest bus company in the Northeast. And I called him at home, and I said, Chris, I got a problem. And I told him what it was. He said, I'll call you back. Where are you going to? Where? What's your next stop? And uh, I told him. He said, all right, on uh, Trinity Place uh, and Rector, there'll be a bus there at 10 a.m. Wow. And what that did was two things. One, got us out of a terrible mess. And my tour operator customer is now a loyal Academy customer. Exactly. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. And Matt, one last one. I've, I've had this tour. I do SUV tours. They're private SUV tours. The SUV that I usually hire is for six people plus the guide and the driver. So the XL, as they usually call them. And we, we had the wrong count for this tour. So there were seven passengers plus me and the driver. So basically, I either was not going to sit <laughs> or the driver was not going to drive or one of the clients were not going to be on the tour. And he decided, the guy who hired me, that you know, although he just got married yesterday, the day before in New York, that he was not gonna be part of the tour. I said, that will not happen. I gave the tour being in the trunk, in the back, in the back, in the very back of that SUV. So that's something also that can go really wrong when you have the wrong number of people on your tour. You, you touch on several interesting ideas. First, of course, makes me think of my first rule of touring, which is I never lose anyone by accident. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you also mentioned counting and the counting of people. Now, it was interesting because you talked about when you did count and when you didn't count. Of course, I work with a lot of school groups, my bread and butter. I was butter, about to go there. And I never count heads. <laughs> uh, it's very important that I don't count heads because it's most of the companies I freelance with actually have rules requiring that you yeah. not count heads. Now I see some of you are surprised. I have to let their group leader do it. Yeah. I have to let exactly. the lead, lead teacher or whoever their tour operator do it. 
Why? Because if they make a mistake, it's they're the liable. Yeah. If I make a mistake, we're liable. <laughs> you know, it is, and it's no fun thinking about that. Oh it's like I always say that a guide is one part entertainer, one part educator, and one part traffic least, cop. Exactly. And the traffic cop is by far the least fun. <laughs> it's it's the part of the you know nobody ever says that's the part of the job they're looking forward to that day, but it's often the most important. So with all of that in mind, let me ask, who do you feel most beholden to when you're on a tour? Like I used to do uh, food tours, and I hated them. And I hated them because I didn't like being beholden to the food vendors who, oh, you're 20 minutes behind schedule, the food I had ready for you is cold. You know, I didn't like, you know, owing anyone anything except the travelers who had paid to take the tour. I wanted them to be the ones I was beholden to. Do you guys ever work with sponsors or vendors or anything like that that you have to be beholden to? Sure. Yeah. I'm on water taxi with you, so yeah, we're beholden to that company and the boat and the captain. I mean, we're on a boat, and we have a captive audience, which is great. <laughs> they have to listen to us because they can't get off till the next stop. <clears throat> uh, but, <clears throat> but we are at the whim of the captain, the boat, the weather, the whatever, so that is Definitely. And then, like you said, anytime we work for a company as a freelancer, you are beholden to that company. So you have to know, yeah, yeah their restrictions, you know, no politics, don't do head counts, whatever their little quirky things are. Uh, a, a bit of a double story kind of comes to my mind. And um, I will sum it up in two words Hurricane Sandy. Yeah. Um, I was with uh, 68 students and uh, only eight adults from Wales. They know what rain's all about. But, um, you know, I was actually overseeing it for my company, Kristen's Tours. I believe uh, it was three different groups that were coming here to New York. Now, who am I beholden to is obviously each and every one of those group leaders to say, okay, where are you? What, you know, where your guide is supposed to be, where I'm supposed to be. But um, yeah, I think I'm also beholden to Mother Nature, okay? And if you decided to get on a plane and come and fly into a city that is about to be hit by the biggest storm that we've seen in a hundred years, yeah, uh, I'm gonna be beholden to the fact that I gotta make sure that everybody is where they're supposed to be and doing what they're supposed to do. Um, I'm also, um, held to uh, what you've paid for, okay? So my first um, uh, uh, kind of, you know, thing that I was pointed towards when I was with my group of 68 was what did you pay for and how can we get as much done from that? So I'm now on the phone, on two phones, trying to make sure that Bubba Gump's where you spent, you know, uh, $1,200 for lunches, the Empire State Building. Yeah, you can tell your parents that you went up to the 86th floor of the Empire State Building and you saw nothing but storm clouds kind of going by, but you were in the strongest building, you know, in New York City that is withheld, you know, over all of these years uh, in its own story. But, you know, you, you have to um, decide what are going to be the factors that are most important in what you do you know, for the buck that they've paid. Um, and also, of course, you know, uh, their safety, etc. You know, uh, the first little group that arrived was uh, only 20 people. The woman got to the hotel and she called me angry and said, well, we um, prepaid for this restaurant for dinner and they're closed. And I said, yeah, the mayor of the city and the governor of the state basically said that everybody needed to go home and you arrived, and you're staying around the corner from the Hilton, which is the largest hotel in New York. I think you can find something to eat. We'll make sure you get a refund. So, you know, um, it is really um, uh, sometimes about holding to what your uh, clients have paid for, but also, of course, first and foremost, worrying about their safety. I would say um, the client. I'm, I'm, I'm just not even going about the company or anything, the client. You behold to the client. And 
they happy, you happy, the boss is happy. If the boss can't understand the client is happy, they happy, their business is happy, that's their problem. But, you know, if the client is not happy and you're beholding to your company, trust me, you will feel it. You're in trouble, okay? So, talk about the food industry. I haven't, I've done my own food tours and I never felt that if the, the food was not good that I had to go there. But I have work for companies that give you vouchers, you know, for discount, and you have to give them to the clients. I never, <clears throat> I never gave those vouchers to the clients, never. It's always at the bottom of the bus. If you wanna take it, fine. If you don't wanna take it, fine. But I know one thing, you will leave a review and it's gonna be a good review, you know, because I wasn't trying to sell you something because that's not my job, that was never my job, that's not why you're listening to me. So I'm always trying to make the client happy. You know, if the client is not happy because they had a bad day, that's their problem, but I will try to make them happy. That's, that's the piece of people I'm people to. This is all great stuff, and I keep on hearing things that make me think of other questions, then I hear new things and make me forget the other questions. But I've heard several of you, I mean, certainly Lee touched on this a lot, and Robin touched on it very recently. The number of times you hear companies and other guides remind you, no discussing politics on tour. Sounds like a perfectly sensible rule. Until the day that there is a job post on the jobs board of the Guides Association saying, we want a tour all about politics and the election. <laughs> and that is actually the subject matter that they seek. No discussing sex and politics in mixed company. So our friend Bob Skiba from Philadelphia, his Gay History of Philadelphia tour would not exist at all. Fred Cookenham's tour of Ayn Rand's New York and Michael Pelagati's tour all about his personal experiences as a member of the uh, Occupy movement, would, which you can tell just by those two things are on opposite ends of the you know, political spectrum and they're both very interesting. I know both men. Uh, these tours would not exist if your clients are from Argentina. It is considered rude not to talk about politics. You know, talking politics, chatting politics is such a cultural thing in Argentina that to refuse to do so is inherently bad customer service. So let's talk for a minute about how to talk politics on tour and how not to. Well, I think one of the things is, again, just deal with the facts. I mean, one of the questions we get most often, um, particularly with Trump in the White House, is, you know, what does New York think? And that's very easy for us to say. It's, you know, <laughs> four boroughs were blue and one borough was red. And, you know, Can't so I think, think you, can be, you can be superficial and not get into your it's own political <laughs> opinion. I think that's what you have to be wary of. You've got to mm -hmm. keep your personal opinion out of it. I mean, how can you talk New York City history and not talk politics? I mean, so I think when they say no politics, they're actually, you don't want to engage with the current today, today yeah. what's happening right now, and you don't want to inject your yeah. personal opinion into it. Yeah, uh, explaining why is the Staten Island Ferry free? Right. <laughs> that definitely has political roots. Uh, part of it is that uh, since Staten Island doesn't have a subway, that Staten Islanders would have to pay an extra fare when the Metro card with the free transfer benefit came through. The fact of the matter is that two of the mayors were Republicans and Staten Island is very Republican. That didn't hurt either, but uh, it basically was a matter of it being equitable. Uh, why should you, because you live there, uh, should you have to pay an extra fare? So that's how that came about, and you're talking about facts. Um, and, and this, being an old history major, I try to keep it to that. Uh, and explaining Tammany Hall. And, being a Dragnet fan. <laughs> uh, and Tammany Hall, and you know, I, I knew Carmine G. De Sapio. I mean, you know, this is, uh, you know, I, it's, but again, it, it'll be historical fact. I have a university group that asks for a political tour. Mm -hmm. That's what I do. Do you ever get asked your opinion? 
Do people say what? Like, because people have asked me, well, not lately, but like about a year ago, people were asking me all the time, what do you think of Mayor de Blasio? You know, yeah, God I, knows why they wanted to know what I thought of Mayor de Blasio, but they were asking. So, does that kind of thing happen to you? That occasionally comes comes to pass. You know. I for religion. Um, I, the facts definitely you can't deny. Like, but if you ask me to do a political tour, you're asking the wrong person, first of all. Uh, I won't have much to talk about. But I know that if you are a democratic, if people who are asking the, the political tour are Republican, you in for trouble. <laughs> so, you know, with moderation, whatever you're gonna do that day, you're not gonna be campaigning, um, you know, for your party. You so, step onto the bus and you see a sea of red hats. <laughs> oh, God. So a tour guide becomes an actor in that sense. But you know, you got to stick to the fact. Um, whenever political uh, conversation comes in on my tour. But what I get often is, I'm a Muslim, so what I get often is when people, you know, use just directly uh, these attacks by these Muslims, these things by these Muslims, after they enjoy three quarter of my tour, which when I say they enjoy, you know, they had a good time. And I have to reveal at that point, oh yeah, uh, by the way, uh, that's the mosque that I go pray to all the time, you know, and you, you should see the face. <laughs> Talk about point. shut it down. Um, <laughs> and, uh, not too long ago, we were in, I don't know if I'm allowed to bring this up, but we were in, um, uh, in Iran, in Iran, hoping to bring a convention, a tourism convention of tourist guide in New York. Uh, I had worked for two years with some of my colleagues, uh, going to hotels, restaurants, you know, working with the top of the industry of tourism in the country to bring a convention uh, that would have otherwise brought $1.74 million in in uh, um, revenue in New York, and we had to bid for this. Uh, we went. It, it happened in Iran. That's where the bid happened. So you know, it's not like we can do it over Skype. We have to go there. We went. We were against Georgia and Thailand. Big competition. You know, they gave their best. But we New York. We gave everything. You know, because anything you need, you can find it here. So we lost because this so happened at the same time there was an executive order. It, it just so happened. It was same. Just, the day. same day. The, the, the uh, day before the presentation. The same day. Uh, you can find this on YouTube. Uh, it happened. So, yeah, I don't talk politics on tours, but, you know, these are things that affect what we do on a daily basis, you know. But still, after this executive order and we lost the bid to four points, four votes, people came. I gave tour to people from Pakistan. Oh my gosh, they, they loved. The, the city, they love the place. You have people from all around the world, and what I've learned, I said at the very start, the first question is tolerance, because understanding the difference between cultures allow you to be more tolerant, you know? And by deciding to focus on one party or religion and just stay on that and just talking about all the goods about it only on a tour, I don't think you're achieving that tolerance. This is just my opinion. That's why I, when it comes to those topics, I'd rather stick to the fact, unless you just want a class, Can you know. Can I do, yeah. Another reason I became an educator in the museum field and then naturally fell into the tour industry is I feel like what we do is so important, just teaching people that people are people. We're all the same. We're all humans. And we do see ourselves as peace ambassadors. It's a... Uh, it's, a, it's the concept that Ibrahima really introduced and pushed forward the last two years, and I, I believe most of us believe that. And I think that is how we feel. I, I know personally, for me, it's how I feel I really contribute. You know, I'm not going to go into politics or become a great millionaire and save the city, but I'm a lowly tour guide, but every day I'm, I'm a peace ambassador, and I'm, I'm teaching people about our city and that we're all just humans. Yes, um, you know, I lived in uh, Milan, Italy for 13 years, and uh, my husband and I very funnily had this, you know, thing where we just did not realize 
how uh, this election was going to turn out. I lived through an era in Milan of a gentleman by the name of Silvio Berlusconi. Ooh. And uh, okay. yeah, okay, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel as if we're living in this kind of literal repeat. You know what I mean? Like, I was like, wait a minute, who rewound and put me in New York with the same dude? Like, all he did was color his hair. And um, I, I do tours, you know, in Italian for people who are older, for people who are younger. Uh, I take them to Washington, D.C. I haven't been to Washington yet. I will be in about uh, five days, actually, uh, taking um, an Italian small group, thank the Lord, um, uh, down to D.C. But the first question, as soon as I would start a tour here in New York in the past year, has been, so, a lot of because in the Pensity Questo Trump. And I'm like, what do you mean? What do I think of him? We've known who Trump is for my entire life. So, um, and I know who Berlusconi is from experience. So, as we, you know, as all of my colleagues have said, we speak from experience and we speak upon facts. But now all of a sudden I have, you know, I'm affronted with this thing of, okay, Oh, so you, you know, you know, you lived in Italy during this period and you now live in, but, and you know who Trump, you know, like, so I'm almost forced, you know, that I have to give some sort of an opinion and I will, I will, I will find and dig through the, the worst of every news, whatever link and give them the, the, the worst possible fake news that I can say an answer to and say like, I'm not going to answer that. You know what I mean? At some point, uh, once in a while, we have to take this neutrality, this neutral, you know, position where we say, you know what, I don't have an opinion for you. You know, my opinion is for my friends and for my family. And, you know, I just, I, I got to take, you know, the high road or the low road, whatever road you want to call it. Okay. But I'm, I'm, I'm just going to drive. Now. Okay. My God, that is the most disciplined thing I've ever yeah, heard. And, and I, I, I really, I, I, and I, and I definitely say that most tour guides, you find it difficult. You really, uh -huh. really do. You, I mean, oh, yeah. you know, look, look, Matt's head's about to explode. Um, but you, you really, you, you have to pick your battles. That's where. Um, I, I've learned something in the fact of, you know, don't don't start a fire, you know, when you, you just because you got two matches and you know what what how to light it, you know what I mean? Just leave it alone, and and you have to let people know, you know what? I'm not going to go there. I'm just I just can't. It's, you, you make a very interesting point talking about the fact that you know, we are New Yorkers. We have known about the political leader that we are now all talking about a lot longer than anyone else has exactly. and a lot more intimately than anyone else has. I want to close the, politi the politics aspect just by quoting a friend of ours uh, that I mentioned a minute ago, Michael Pelagotti. He's a young tour guide. He's in his yes. 20s and he's very good and he's uh, very smart, even if he's not quite as smart as he thinks he is. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but he, he's a very talented guide and about a year ago, before everyone had made up their own minds about candidates, people used to ask him on the double-decker buses all the time, uh, what his opinion was, and he gave a brilliant factual answer that revealed his opinion that was not an inherently political statement, and it said everything. Do you know this story? No, I didn't. People said, so, so Michael, what, what do you think of Donald Trump? And he said, he owes my uncle $45,000. What do you think I think of him? There you go. <laughs> and that was all there was to that. Yes. Let's talk about something far more positive, and then I think at some point we want to open up to questions on the floor. But but I've got to ask, speaking of questions, what's the funniest question a tourist has ever asked you? Oh! <laughs> Hit it, Robin. Um, I do a lot of museum tours, obviously, because of my background, and my favorite one is standing in front of the beautiful Caravaggio at the Met. And the tourist asked me if the painting was real. <laughs> so that is usually yes. mine. <laughs> Excellent. Who else has mine? I'm going to go first. I, I have two. Um, one uh, happened to my friend Jimmy, but uh, this, one of the standard things we say about New York City Hall, it's the oldest continuously used city hall in the U.S. And one person on his tour said, still? Uh, and then the other one, this, was, this happened to me, is why did they build the Brooklyn Bridge before the automobile was invented? Wow. 
Wow. Got to think about that one for a second. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it took me a while to come up with an answer. And I said, well, they were thinking of not building it, but somebody said, you know, they're going to build, they're going to make cars soon. <laughs> <laughs> if you're going to ask a stupid question, you're going to get a stupid answer. answer. Yeah. Oh, my gosh, really. Hey, you... I, I can't think of one, really, but there was the, this, this one that always comes back. It's not really stupid. It's, it's it doesn't have to be fun. stupid. It just has to be funny. Yeah. <laughs> five, well, I don't know if I'll, that'll make you laugh, but this five-year-old, I think I said, uh, what, one World Trade Center is 1,776 foot tall, um, you know, to match the year of Declaration of Independence, uh, and that makes it the tallest building uh, in the U.S. Um, and I'll probably ask, uh, can you tell me what 1,000, I did not say the matching the year of Declaration in it, and can you tell me why it's 1,776 foot tall, and the kids say, I oh, know it's like almost my face. Why? Why? Because it's the tallest building in New York. Okay, great. That's what I just said. But that, that's that's really something that I've said. He was not wrong about. But I, when I was a double decker tour guy, I used to get. I know it's not really funny, but I don't remember the facts really well. I get all the time people asking me when I point at the Statue of Liberty at Battery Park and Castle Clinton. You all know where that is. Uh, that's where you go. You change your voucher, and then behind the the, the 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 building there, there is a white tent. There is a white tent security checkpoint. You make the line, then you get on the boat, then you go to Liberty Island. Somehow, somewhat, there is always someone asking me, "Where for the Statue of Liberty? Which way?" Why and I always say. Walk straight when your feet start getting wet, show them the <laughs> always has been people always ask you where is the statue after you just point it at the Statue of Liberty and it always kinda of was weird. If, if I may share one about my friend Ibrahima. Uh, oh dear. I was this is a beauty. You're in trouble. Uh, and, and it's a running gag between the two of us, by the way. Oh, yeah, I get that. Uh, when we were uh, I was I helped develop the guide corps at City Sites and uh, this is one of my great winners over here. Um, and we were going at that time, there was separate from Grey Line, we were going after them, Hammer and Tommy. And we were going to have multilingual tours like they did. So we needed a French speaking guy. There he is. So he's standing in front of a bus where it says, Toute la cité en français. This couple walked up to him. And said, "Parlez-vous français?" He said, "No, je parle chinois." No, I speak Chinese. So this has been the running gag between the two of us. Um, that that brings me to the definite uh, love of my, you know, uh, my second country, Italy. Uh, Italians will always ask you the silliest question when you've just stated, you know. So here we are. You know, it took one year. Two, uh, a month and two weeks to build the Empire State Building. And, uh, you know, you talk for another couple of minutes and, so, Christine, is that the Empire State Building? Yes. It is yes. The it's still the Empire State Building since two minutes ago I just said that. Um, I think one of the uh, best, and I don't know if this was um, a joke that I heard or that, but I, I believe that I, I, it, it happened firsthand. Uh, I was at Battery Park and a little girl said, oh my gosh, so does like the Energizer company and Duracell give like concerts here? What? Again, like, you're just, you're kind of like, wait, what? You know? No, it was a battery. And then like, as you're explaining, you go, God, really? Um, the worst was probably being on a busload of students. And I, I really have to say, I do not know what's happening to our children today. I don't have children. When people ask me, do you have any children? I go, I have thousands of them. Thank you, they're not mine. Um, but uh, driving up 8th Avenue, I always get into my thing about the statue of Christopher Columbus. Thank you to the country of Italy. Christopher Columbus sailed the oceans blue in 1992. <laughs> and I oh just put the microphone down 
and said, okay, everybody get off the bus. Yeah. Yeah. Do you all get often, um, you know, after you leave Times Square, 15 minutes, are we still in Manhattan? Yeah. I, I get, I get that. Yeah. 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 I'm wondering if where anybody ever towers. gets things like, get that uh, where, where, where's Alcatraz? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I get yes. that, yeah, uh, all the time. Yeah. But, you know, the, these, these stories that guides have of the clueless tourists, and, of, and we say it with love because, of course, the tourists are our customers. They're the reason we have jobs. I feed my daughter because of these people, uh, you know, but um, I get these from everywhere. During, when I was president of GANIC, I was friends with the other association presidents all over the country. Stephen Herchak of, of South Carolina told me the charming question, you know, were your buildings always this old? <laughs> well, no, we no. Don't. <laughs> you know, and, and Vicki Schwartz of, of the uh, Washington D.C. Guides Guild probably had my favorite of how, how do they get all the flags to fly the same way? <laughs> I wish I were kidding. You cannot make this up. You cannot make this up. Absolutely. All right. Let, let us, uh, Lance, uh, do, do you invite them, do I invite them questions from the floor about what we do and what we're about? Yeah, and, and perhaps before we do, you can mention about uh, giving a tour okay, at the end of yes. the book. All right, Lance asked me to give his choice of words, not mine, one of my famous tours of the club. I've been a member of the Players for 17 years and I do take people around the club and I'm happy to do that after we're all done here as well. So there's a private party downstairs that's also going until round about 9, 9.30. So, you know, if they're still doing it, we will skip those rooms, but hopefully they'll be done and we can see them. But I'm more than happy to give a tour of the club for anyone who's interested. Um, sorry? It's both. Is it a serious tour? A serious, serious tour or a funny tour? Which would funny. you like, ma'am? Yes. Both. Okay. <laughs> seriously funny. Matthew, I think you I think figured you me out by funny. now. Okay, there you go. <laughs> that's funny. Seriously. <laughs> favorite of mine in those two branches as Berlusconi posters with red X's. Oh, wow. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Berlusconi posters. So, posters. Okay. Okay. anybody Berlusconi here want to know anything? How do you deal with the tourist who has already gone through the tour or knows it all? Oh, the know-it-all tourists. Yes. The, we've been here for a week. We know everything about the city. Hit it, Kristen. <laughs> well, <laughs> Would you like to give the tour today? You know, um, it, that is like the, the the best of the best because what what I do is a a kind of outside inside tour for for them. You know, as we're walking, you already know this, of course. <laughs> but let me tell the rest of the group, okay? and then you can ask me, you know, whatever inside question it is that you think you need oh, to know because yeah, you know, awesome. or they're asking those questions that are like. But wasn't it in, you know, at, so wasn't it at 1.15 p.m. that so-and-so happened on September 12th? I'm giving a date. I'm like, At Anderson too. Cooper's place. Well, yeah. Exactly. You know, at Anderson <laughs> Cooper's house yeah. when they made the... Oh. So, yeah, you know, you, you give them, you, you, you know, you, you humor them, you know, and let them know, oh, look, I'm going to just, I'm going to tell the rest of the group. Oh, man. Oh. Okay. I, I I love I love I live for that. And you do. Like, <laughs> we do. We do. I I'm from Senegal. Like I've been doing this ten years now, thanks to Lee and everybody. I have a lot more to learn. But when I get on the microphone, I'm the last person you think will tell you fact about New York. And you get ready because I'll give you to the second. I'll give you to how many miles they are in that Empire State Building. Now I'll compare with some How many people. are there? 186 miles. <laughs> and 1,250 <laughs> foot to the 100 second floor, 1,453 foot tall to the peak of the yeah. antenna. That's, right. and that's 443 meters. That's 100 meters tall in the Eiffel Tower. Let me not get struck. Let me just say, <laughs> if you think you want to know more than me and I'm getting paid to do this job, I'm going to ask you a simple question. Something like, is it Grand Central Station or Grand, or Grand Central, Central Terminal? I'm going to start with those little stuff. And then you're going to go, isn't it Grand Central Station? No, it's Terminal. But then I will go for, is it, what is it? The Bronx or Bronx? And then you're going to go Bronx. And I'm, no, it's the Bronx. <laughs> 
once we settle that, I think we're done here. You're now quiet. You know, you're like, <laughs> just gonna get ready to learn. And you have to do this because they ruin the tour for everybody they else. Will. They will. Yeah. They do. Do not let people control your tour. I, I have a little prop I want to share. It's called a lesson. This <laughs> is a very important thing in our business. It is a New York City tour guide's license issued by the Department of Consumer Affairs. Oh, what's that? You don't have one? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, somehow, uh, for those experts, uh, the I find to be their aphrodisiac, if you will, the flat iron. Mm. Oh, the, the and they're always wrong expert. about it. <laughs> that was the tallest building in the world. No, it isn't. And when? <laughs> we went. Maybe. Uh, I said, when was it taller than the Park Row building? <laughs> you know, I was going to say, when we get down to Park Row, you tell me how park, the Park Row building lost 30 years. Uh, or 30 feet and. Uh, yeah, I was going to say 30 uh, years. And four years. Oh, thank you. <laughs> but it's never done with, like. No. With, with, you know, it's always. Like in a very, it's sarcastic. The whole tour is usually sarcastic because yeah. <laughs> you're dealing with people who live in New York. But it's done with kind of like, uh, this is my time. Like, let me do my job and you know just enjoy it. And I'm willing to learn. Like, there are times when somebody will will not be like a know it all. And usually you could tell. You have to learn from them when they are like, I live, I lived in this neighborhood. I grew up in this neighborhood. You really want to open up to that person. Mm -hmm. And giving a tour at the end of the day is to, to be open, to connect, to have passion, and to listen. So, you know, you do want to open up with these people. But when they want to take over your tour every five seconds, that's like, different. oh, you know, you know, I go to this restaurant all the time, by the way, that's the best sushi. In, you know, <laughs> just like keep it to yourself. You know? Now, but sometimes I, you yeah. learn. From this some of the guys. Absolutely. I, I, I actually have, find that very useful. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You can work with that. Yeah. You know, there, there's a part of the uh, a classic route called Museum Mile. Essentially, starts, you know, coming up, coming out of Harlem. You start at 110th Street and make your way down Fifth Avenue. 1200 Fifth Avenue was the longtime home of the great contralto Marion Anderson. And um, I point that out which I learned by walking down Fifth Avenue, and there's this yes. oval plaque on the building. Right. One of the clients was a lovely woman from Finland, a musician, who said that Marian Anderson is extremely popular, uh, or was, and her recordings still are, in Finland, was apparently she mastered the language and sang Finnish folk songs. Wow. I know. Go no, I. Uh, but but this was rather impressive, and it was nice that somebody from you know Finland would know who Marian Anderson is, where I suspect uh, a certain person living at Fifth Avenue and Fifty Sixth Street might not. Um, Don't you take Cutting that off right there. Uh, yeah, uh, what really what we're talking about here is the difference, and it is an important difference, because I mean, I'm a big believer, we, we haven't really touched on this except, you know, sort of peripherally, <clears throat> the difference between a lecture tour and a conversational tour. I really like my tours to be conversational. Of course, I dominate conversations anyway, but, uh, you know, I love turning bits of information into trivia questions, and, and you guys have touched on that. Well, you touched on that with yeah. the five-year-old. You know, does anyone know? And, and that's a very interesting thing. So there is an important difference uh, between a contribution and a takeover. And a takeover exactly. Yeah, and that's a big deal. Uh, as soon as someone may potentially be a takeover, you know, comes to me and starts yapping to me about my city, you know, I try, because, you know, you want to do this with love. You know, we're being snarky about it right now, but you want to do it kindly. These are your clients, you know. Uh, I will try to latch on to something they've said, and like, that's great. I am going to ask you to share that with everyone later. Would you be willing to do that for us? You know, I don't want to put you on the spot, but would you be willing to do that for us? Now they feel really important, which is really what they wanted in the first place. So now they're going to latch on to just that one thing, and they'll I'll call on them when it's their turn. You know, but they already know I'm paying the kind of attention that they so desperately want. You know. So speaking of control, um, 
Were there any other questions? Right. <laughs> what happens if somebody or some people uh, break some rules or, or keep the other people waiting by, by you know, Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> What happens if someone's break a rule or keep other people waiting? Yes. Yeah. Um, that's the question. Mm -hmm. Well, for waiters, I, I actually chastise them pretty pretty Don't openly. I try to embarrass them a little bit just so that they will catch up and keep keep up. Uh, if somebody breaks a rule, I mean, you have to be on it. First of all, you have to give them the rules before they go in. And then if they're adults and they break a rule, then it's on them. It's a little bit different with student groups. You have to really pay attention. And I think one of the ways we mitigate that is we try not to take student groups where there's a lot of rules to break. I mean, you know, you, you pick you pick your battlegrounds. Yeah. With you know, with Europeans uh, smoking. I don't wow. Uh, <laughs> True. On the boats. Yeah. You know, when you're at, uh, they know enough not to smoke on the bus, but as an example, get off at Strawberry Fields, to go over there by the Dakota, and somebody takes their deck of cigarettes out and lights up. And I said, finish that here, because if you get caught with that in the park, it's $50, but to cut out the middleman, you can give me $50. <laughs> and, they, and they get the message. I like that. They get the message immediately. I'm so gonna steal that. I, I'm so dumb. I'm, I'm like, stealing. I'm gonna put okay. it. <laughs> you can all steal that when you see somebody smoking near the subway. And then uh, <laughs> the the other one, um, you know, what I'll do is somebody is late in getting back to the bus. Let's give a round, a round of applause. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. um, and, and that usually works. That's yeah. brilliant. Yeah. Uh, when when dealing with student groups, just to you know, kind of change the. the uh, the uh, effect on it. Um, you know, we are not their parents, we are not their teachers, and I will tell you what you're supposed to be doing and, you know, what is not acceptable, you know. Uh, telling kids that, you know, pointers, uh, you know, the little laser pointers and things are not allowed in certain places, do not shine them on the bus, don't do this and don't do, or just, you know, even speaking loudly, you know, spitting wads of gum onto memorials and things of that, or running in a, in a certain place. Um, my, my attention goes to, okay, I spoke about all of this, and the first person I look at is the group leader. Now you get to take that child and do whatever you will, but get them, from, get them away from the rest of the group because they need to know that they've done something you know, not right. One of my very recent groups just this weekend um, uh, the teacher said, okay, you've all heard the rules, and if anyone breaks Miss Kristen's rules, because that is first rule, my name is not Kristen, I am not your friend, I am not, you know, somebody that you know, my name is Miss Kristen. And, you know, he said, if you disobey what Miss Kristen says, you're going to be holding my hand for the rest of the tour. <laughs> and most of the time, kids are like, I, I like that one. And I say, well, then you get to hold one of your teacher's hands because I'm not holding it. I'm not allowed, you know? And they kind of get it like, ooh, I want to be with my friends and I want to, you know, be being late, especially for students. You're supposed to be in a group of four or more when you're walking around in areas of Times Square. And, uh, and of course, I tell them, please, you know, count your money when you're inside of a store or at a restaurant and you're paying a bill or whatever. If I walk into Grand Central Terminal, there's two boys by themselves and one is walking literally with a fan of money in his hands. I was on the phone and I went, hold on. I said, boy, what are you doing? <laughs> and it was just a, you know, a reactionary and I, I probably, you know, should not have. But he went, I'm sorry, Miss Kristen. <laughs> and he put his money away and he said and he said wait they're right here they're right here and he called the other two boys that were supposed to be with them so you know you do get them to kind of fall into place once in a while. <laughs> I think that um, you can with the fear of God in <laughs> while you're on the tour itself you can do that I don't know about many rules besides ethical rules that really people can break 
Um, you know, you're not gonna do it to her like, okay, you make sure you only sit on your seat, not on somebody else's seat. <laughs> if you're gonna look to the right, make sure you don't spit on the purse. You know, you, you can't have so many rules on a tour, like, okay? Uh, if you're gonna take a picture when you reach out, make sure you have the order. You know, you can't have too many rules. But if people are starting to be really unethical about things, they can only do it so many times. Right. For example, if you're gonna make a few stops on your tour, and the first time they late, you know, look at, look, just look at that. You know, the second time they late, you might have to talk to them or something of that nature. So visually, if you're doing a tour and somebody is talking on the phone and being loud, it's like being at the movie theater. You know, somebody's sitting there too, and they like, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I have a colleague who said once, he usually says, excuse me, excuse me, are you a doctor? Are you a lawyer? Okay, hang up now, thank you. <laughs> well, I, I visually look at them, eye contact, and then I give them a sign, stop. You know, if they smoking in the park, I don't wanna talk because everybody's listening to what I say, I don't. So I just wave or look at them, eye contact, stop. Then if they don't, I walk towards them. I'm looking at this way and I touch whatever they're doing wrong, I just touch it for them to stop. If they don't, that's when I talk. And when I talk, it's bad. It's done. It's, it's, it's not good. I've never seen that so <laughs> Because I'm always first phase, phase one, phase two. And I'm a good boy. He's like, don't let phase me get to three. phase three. Okay. You know, the 9-11 memorial, though, yes. is a place where yeah. I yes. usually tell the yeah. kids. So I think that's the kind of rules she's talking about, rules right. of respect. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Remember this. The person next to you may have lost everyone yeah. or may have not even seen them. And in that case, when, when you are like literally being rude, uh, I will stop and it's gonna be more emotional. Exactly. Everything's gonna just turn from being sad to crying for yeah. everybody. And I have to say, five of us up here are professionals and sort of do that. We do our talks about the memorial, away from the memorial before we walk to the memorial. You know, we have our own, and you will see guides don't do this and that's that's very hard on us <laughs> when we see people behaving inappropriately uh, we do have to correct uh, you. yes uh, so uh, we will call those people out away from you know we don't ever call anybody out when they're on tour but if somebody's acting disrespectful we try to you know, alert I, them that that is how we see you know, I always and, tell people we're going to a place where 2,953 people died that morning. So show proper respect, you know, before we even get there. But I've seen stuff down there that, that's outrageous. The other day, there were these uh, high school, what looked to be a high school group, and they're throwing stuff in, and there are signs all over, do not throw anything in. Mm -hmm. It's about can't you read? Yeah, they should. You know, I, I think the answer to that question may be no. no. no they, they actually shut the memorial down the other day because yeah, I, I saw it. police officers, you know, screaming through the not to, you know, but to elaborate on that, when we see other people acting out in a way that they're not supposed to be, even if they're not on my tour, you know, I will, you know, quietly walk over to them. Kids running up and down, you know, or yeah. jumping from the blocks to blocks, you're not supposed to stand on them. Excuse me, ma'am. I'm sorry, you know, the security is going to say something to yeah. you. I'm yeah. saying something to you out of kindness, but security is going to say something to you if you do this. And, you know, people smoking the, you know, vape things and things like that, thinking that it's okay. And I go, you know, it's not a place to smoke right now or something like that. But you try to be as gentle. Don't touch the survivor right. tree. Yeah. <laughs> Kristen touched on Don't this touch a minute ago when she was talking about having money out and things like that. And it occurs to me we haven't discussed it all evening. And that's safety. All this talk about the 9-11 uh, memorial, the one time I ever had a serious injury with anybody on my tour was on the steps at that memorial. Safety. Um, what do you do? Has anyone else had an injury on tour that they had to handle? I was at the uh, at West Point, and uh, this lovely couple, I was working for a company that does tours for elderly people, older people, let's just say. And I had a couple that literally uh, were both in their 80s, and they've been married for a year, you know? And uh, they, they really, like the whole bus 
you know, we had adopted them as, you know, our aunt, uncle, grandparents, parents, whatever age you were, you put them in that kept that they were that, you know. And um, the woman was constantly worried about, oh, where's my husband, you know? And I, I felt, you know, so he got off the bus to go to the restroom. We're at the last day the last leg of the tour that I've been on for five days through, you know, four states and five cities, first town and everything. My girl gets uh, onto the steps of the bus. She spins around and falls. Mm. This woman is in her 80s. I lost it. I'm like, oh my God, I'm calling security. It's West Point, it's a military academy. Everybody has to get involved. Um, do I need an ambulance? No, no, no. Now she's upset because everybody else is upset. And the husband comes and he goes, I went to the bathroom. You know, <laughs> what's wrong with you? And she's like, I'm so sorry. And so I, you know, get back to our hotel in New York City. And uh, I now feel as if I'm obligated to keep an eye on her. But in all, for all intents and purposes, as tour guides, these are adults and we have an obligation to make sure that you are you know safely doing what you're supposed to be doing but you're supposed to have common sense famous old story of a tour guide telling everybody crossing the street uh, you know it's pretty obvious that if there's a, a red stopped you know sign that means don't walk guy walks across the street gets hit by a taxi and sues everybody Okay, taxi driver has no money, taxi company says whatever, and uh, you know, tour guide gets sued because of your negligence because you decided to cross the street against the light. So, you know, it's all um, relative to safety first, but common sense after. I made sure that, you know, the woman had, uh, I went to her room, I got her an ice pack, she had a huge bruise on her arm, a huge bruise on her leg, I'm thinking the poor thing could have, you know, broken a hip and, you know, I actually went out of the way and I called the kids, you know, and I said, you know, this was the emergency number that we have. I think that she's okay, but please just be aware that this is what happened. So we do uh, have a considerable amount on the police, policing, you know, uh, kind of thing to also be a little bit of a, of a nursemaid or a person to say, all right, here's an ice pack. We cannot administer any medicine. I can't give you an allergy pill. Can't, can't give her an aspirin. You know? I can't give you so, an aspirin. Something actually happened. But, uh, you know, uh, we can say, are you okay? Do you need medical assistance? And we have to so, think about that. Something happened on, on a very it's simple things, you know. A cruise ship comes in, you know, people are loading the luggages, and then you just have to take them for two hours around. And, and uh, this was with Costa, you know, that company that you always wait for that they, their boat <laughs> always get stuck in the middle of the airplane. Wow. <laughs> Excuse me. Mediterranean. Anyway, Costa, Costa Cruises. I don't know if you ever heard of them. So they had this boat and you know the coach drivers, the bus drivers, they are the one who's supposed to load the luggage. Go ahead. Okay, into the hatch. They're the one who's supposed to do that. Some of the drivers, because they fear these are foreigners, they won't do it because they, they don't, get tips. They, they think they won't get tips. Wow. But meanwhile, they don't know that these people understand how it works, and if they don't do it, they won't give them tips. The danger of letting the passenger put their own luggage into that is whenever they put their head in, <gasps> they usually are not aware of getting, uh, them getting them out because the door is so low and they can get hurt. And well, guys, we're gonna take care of it. Have your luggages lined up here. Me and the driver will take care of it. This guy felt like he had to impress his wife or something. So he just took his luggage, put in the head. He was bold. <sighs> He came out even more bold. Yeah. Ooh. He, I'm sorry. Yeah. But here's the thing. It was blood. It came out. These things happen. When it comes to safety, you have to be in charge, you know. You let the driver know when they're supposed to do their job. That's right. This is, my clients won't do this. This is what you're going to do. But the, 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 the one thing that I did want to bring up, because we in that era, is a sense of awareness. Tour guide, tourist guide, 
are people who are very well and very much aware of their surrounding. Most of the time, they usually look ahead and look back, look around people. Before they get to your group, they already know this person is coming or that car or whatever is happening. Uh, with, with these active shooters scenarios and these uh, explosions, these uh, um, scares as they call them, you know, you really have to even be more vigilant, but also uh, transmit that to your to your groups. You know, make sure that they also are on their guards. They are aware of their surrounding at all times. They they use their their flair. You know, if something does not look right, you know, it may not be right. You know, what we say in New York: if you see something, say something. So safety is not just you know, upon you and yourself, but it's up to you to give it to the people you are giving it to. You have to err on the side of caution. You know, the, the traffic signals. As soon as it starts flashing, particularly out of a group of 10 or more, Absolutely. I'm going to wait. Yeah. Absolutely. Wait, we can catch the next one. Yeah. We're going to wait until the next, you know, Probably walk sign wait, comes across. By, I've had that happen too. Robin just says her problem with that is that she waits, then she starts talking about something, and then she misses the next light. And I totally get that. But as Lee said to begin with, you are on the side of caution. You know, better to have that problem than the other problem. Right. Right. Yes. The bar is only going to be open for another 15 minutes, and I need a drink. Uh, Yikes. My friends, you have been stunning and brilliant as I knew you would be. Uh, a dear old friend of mine from school who is now a Presbyterian minister in California once described me as an evangelist for New York City. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't have thought in those terms, but it's a great title. And you are all professional celebrants. And that is what I hope is the great takeaway here, is that what a guide does at the end of the day, we celebrate New York City. And you are part of New York City. I always tell my people, especially if I'm on the boat and we have people from everywhere, you name it, you will find it here. The language, the religion, the music, the cuisine, culture, you want to see the world, come to New York City. The world is here. And every one of you is a part of that, whether you are here to live or here for the weekend. You contribute to the beat and the pace of New York City. And for that, yeah. I thank you very much. All right, I'd like to say thank you to, uh, to Matt and uh, to, our, to our panelists. Oh, are we still up there? Yeah, just a, one second. Uh, the bar's gonna close. <laughs> right, well, just one second, Matt. I, um, and I'm the wino. What the heck? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, thank you. Thank you very much. This is, as I mentioned, this is our last event of the spring season. But um, if you're not subscribed to the New York Society's uh, uh, online, uh, please make sure you are, and we'll keep you posted on uh, both on videos like this one and resources made available and upcoming events. We encourage uh, membership in the Institute of General Semantics, and we'll be co-sponsoring with the Institute of General Semantics the annual Alfred Krzybski Memorial Lecture in October. Uh, that'll be given by Professor Terry Moran, who took part in some of our events in, in, in the fall um, and is an expert on language and political language and propaganda. So we invite you all to uh, attend that and also uh, there'll be a symposium to go with that, and uh, the call for papers is out, um, and we'll make all of that information available. Thank you again. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much.